So it's not so the, the chair conference is always going to have axial positions and equatorial positions. And so it's all about okay, which one of these versions puts my largest substituent into that into the equatorial position. And we'll look at some more graphs and some more figures showing um, showing that, and that should make it make some sense. Um, this is a good question. If you have the same, if you have a boat with the right substituents, could you conceivably have a a conformer um, where the boat is more stable than the chair? Probably. Um, but it would, it would have to be either something bicyclic where it's like locked into the chair or where they get two fused rings or some really something funky going on. Because almost always your one of your chair conformers is almost always going to be more stable unless you've got something else going on that's a, a, a real extreme case. I was thinking like dual um, equatorial methyl groups of awful. Uh, boat comfort, comfort coming off of the, the, the so if we had power. so if this we had a big meth or a big group here we'll just use a methyl as our example but even bigger would make it even so now if, if it shifts into the boat so into the chair one of them would be axial then right yeah what I'm thinking is instead of on the points the balance turn on the actual base of the boat so down there. you still wind up, even though we look at this as being the points of the boat, um, these are also points of the boat. Uh, okay, right on. So, so it's, it's all just frame of reference, so it would be the same. You could conceivably have something, if you had a bicyclic structure, you could actually lock it into the boat configuration by having that something, yeah. that like that. that. And then it can't go to the book to the chair conformer without breaking a bond, and it won't do that. Is that a tricyclic then? So this would still be considered bicyclic, but there's two. Even though that you could count then, three different rings, yeah, gotcha. we still call it a bicyclic structure because one points apart. From the right, point. exactly. We would draw this normally would be I assume, draw something like that, but there are other ways of drawing bicyclic structures um, that make it a little bit more, you know, could basically. It just, so just doesn't show the boat, but that's what it would look like from above, right? Yeah. And then that's a good segue into this next question, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So the trick with thinking about potential energy surfaces is that they're not just 3D. Right. They're, they have one dimension for every atom in the molecule. Right. Even if we're ignoring the hydrogens, that's still going to be a six, seven, eight dimensional surface that we're trying to visualize. So you absolutely yes, it's going to be a complex surface, and you can get you can do things where you have two different valleys or where, and that's basically what we're looking at. If we look at at you know our chair to the twist boat to the boat to the twist boat to the back to the other chair conformer, you could think of this as this is going to repeat um, in in this direction. Um, so it's, but if you can think of this as being a valley, this is being a valley, and this is a third valley, really. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it is going to wind up being sort of a mixture of a lot of things. It's going to wind up getting a linear combination of these different potential energies. We're just looking at one slice of it though here. I see. I was, I was breaking it down into smaller pieces. Even smaller than that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can always take a slice of these potential energy surfaces and get something that looks like what you're describing, but it's like, okay, what dimension am I slicing in? What angle am I slicing in to do that? Gotcha. And so we tend to pick these potential energy surfaces so that when we do take a slice of them, it's in a, where the x axis would make sense. Um, so it might be like a rotational 
potential energy surface where we're looking at spinning something, or it might be looking at stretching one of the bonds. As one of the bonds stretches, you're going to get a particular shape of that potential energy surface. Gotcha. Um, so just pay attention to the x-axis and that will make these make more sense. But yeah, it's, it's absolutely worth remembering these potential energy surfaces are complex. They're not complex in the mathematical sense. We're not dealing with imaginary numbers per se, but they are n-dimensional surfaces where n is the number of atoms in our molecule. Um, imaginary numbers are involved in calculating these, but not in the potential energy surface once we get the potential energy surface built. So I was going to say, I, I, I think I misspoke in the question. I said two values because I was taking a slice of it. So the original number would be three, and then over here would be four, where one of or two of them is the local minimum. Would that right. Be more. Yeah. Minimum? And really, in the way to think about those valleys, since, since we have the language, is that we're looking at local minimums, is what we're calling a valley. There is going to be some global minimum for the for the um, uh, molecule, and that's going to be whatever the most stable conformer is. Gotcha. Is going to be the global minimum. Global. Right? Is that is that the phrase? Who's, who's taking calculus more recently than me? That our absolute minimum. What's the term that's used? Yeah, global is our global. global. Okay. Because there's no real absolute. It's no right. Absolute. We all have to, we have to judge it relative to something that yeah. we're just calling zero. Um, yeah, so the global minimum is going to be whatever your most stable conformer is. Um, but then there's definitely going to be other local minimums based on that, that are concave up like that, where you, where you reach the bottom of a, of a valley or a basin, if you want to think of it like that. Right. Because over here, you drew a circle around two local minimums, but right. this would be thing is a, exactly. Yeah. So really that's a local, that's a local minimum. That's a local minimum with a small barrier in between the two, but with that barrier being so small, they can shift back and forth between these really relatively easy, but from a mathematical calculus point of view, absolutely. The surface that now is really messy has, has four local minimums, yeah. including, oops, including the global minimum for the way that I drew it was the one that's at the very bottom there. But if it was symmetrical, there's two equally valid global minimums. Right. They all have the same energy in theory, and it's a symmetric molecule. Gotcha. All right. Uh, quick note, Edward, do quiz four, not quiz five. Quiz five was for next week, but I mixed up the due dates. Oh, okay. So don't take quiz five. I did it. Did you already? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought that, I thought that was true. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll resolve some of those questions. I like it though. I mean, I learned a lot. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's good. The questions weren't that far out. That's probably why you didn't immediately raise red flags. Yeah. No, I thought it was cool. It was, it was just like substitute. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, exactly. So we're going to talk more about some um, substituted cyclohexanes today in more detail. This is the part that I just sort of said real fast at the end of class on Thursday. Um, we looked at axial versus equatorial with a bromine, um, but anything that's larger than a hydrogen, if you oppose anything larger than a hydrogen, um, you wind up making these one, three diaxial interactions. And I guess I shouldn't say anything larger than the hydrogen, anything with more volume, anything with bigger steric space. Because if you replace a hydrogen with a deuterium, so a hydrogen isotope, since the volume is all taken up by the electrons, that we shouldn't see any difference because it's the same volume. So which means the same steric interactions, even though it's a heavier atom by mass. But for the most part, we're, we will do some, some isotope substitution as a way to show that's actually one of the ways that they work out different mechanisms in OCHEM is, okay, we have an active hydrogen on this molecule, let's put a deuterium there and then see, see where that lines up down the road because that might tell us something about a biology or a, a biochemical pathway or a particular me mechanism. Deuterium has an extra neutron, right? Correct. So it's everything's identical to a hydrogen, it's just with a mass of two instead of one. Um, so when we have these 
they call it a mono-substituted cyclohexane. This puts the substituent in the equatorial position. Oh, it's okay. That one's the classroom phone. <laughs> Who's calling the classroom? Uh, so the, the actual interactions that we see are called 1,3 diaxial interactions. Because if we call this carbon 1, then this is 2 and this is carbon 3. Or if we count the other way around the, the molecule, then the, that back carbon is carbon 3. Right? And it winds up, this is, these are the actual interactions that cause issues, that cause those steric uh, interactions. Because you wind up with them all pointed the same direction, they're somewhat, they're basically in a gauche configuration. So remember when we were first looking at these um, Newman projections, we called this the gauche position. If we have something, if this is carbon one, this is the tip of our carbon. If we if we shift our frame of reference to look at it like a Newman projection, this carbon one is now in a gauche position relative to the point of the molecule. And so you wind up with this bumping into those, and that causes unfavorable interactions. So that's the more specific reason why axial has more steric interference and why it's less stable is these one three diaxial interactions which is basically just a gauche interaction except that instead of just a methyl over here you have the rest of the cyclohexane molecule right so anything that's that's in the axial position is going to interact with the or with the substituents that are two carbons that are away. And they're going to be in that same um, one three diaxial interaction. And the larger the objects are, the bigger issue we have. And so if it's 95 to 5, and when you have a methyl, that makes it pretty clear already that equatorial, which you're putting your biggest um, substituent in the equatorial position is better than the axial position, and that gets even larger as we get bigger and bigger substituents. Would it not just be 1, 3, but could it be, what would it be, uh, 1, 5? We would call both of them 1, 3 because they're one carbon away. So if you just count it the other way, like, oh, not not considering the methyl with two hydrogens, do they have uh, an effect on each other in this axial? These two? Yeah. Are they not on each other? They're, they'll they will interact with the carbons over here. Okay. Um, so whatever is only, attached. Only one three, not. I don't know exactly. What the numbers are. <laughs> so if if you, it would be one three and five. All the axial position for one, three, and five all interact with each other. We just don't say one, three, five because that five is really just three counting the other direction as well. It's like when you're naming yeah. cyclohexanes, it's because like yeah. you can always change yeah. the way you're going about it. So right. if, whether it's at five or three, it's still it's one, three. one carbon removed from where the substituent is. Um, and that's to be more, to be most accurate, we should say one three five, but it's just that's one extra syllable, and chemists don't like to do that. Right. And um, it's the same either way. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, and so, and then here's the other, the Newman projection of the other comer. You do that chair flip. If you put the other, the methyl in the other position here. In the equatorial position, now it's pointed away from everything else. It's anti relative to those one, three positions, which means it's not going to interact and have the same issues. The chair flip is the double 60. Is, is chair flip, yeah, exactly. You rotate the top, rotate it to the boat, and then back down the other way. And when you do that, you wind up switching these positions. And so now you wind up with it in the equatorial position. So it's, it's hard to visualize it when it's in the Newman projection. I think it's easier to see how the chair flips work when it's the way we normally draw the chair homer. Um, but the net result is it puts the methyl 180 from the rest of the ring instead of parallel to the rest of the ring. Right. The way that chair flipped that in my mind is just rotate about 60, and then that would 
put the back. Yeah, I would have done that too. To rotate down. this over here and then that one down. That that would be the way to do it. Because for some reason this looks like a mirror. It does, but because there isn't an a uh, asymmetric carbon, right. so it's in it's in. They just did it for the sake of showing that it's 180. And it's the same structure either way, so. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right, and so in the, again, the bigger the substituent is, the more we see that effect. When it's dye substituted, that just means if we have to, sometimes that means that there's a way that they can both be equatorial. And sometimes it's, we have to choose which of them gets to be equatorial and which of them has to be axial. In that case, whatever is largest is always, we're always going to put the largest substituent, physically largest, in the equatorial position most of the time. So we had a you know, 99.99 to 0 0.01 ratio when it's a T butyl group. And there's a whole list of these, and so we can use these to estimate. Those di what are the energy, the energy of those one three diaxial interactions? Because if you know what the equilibrium ratio is, from the equilibrium ratio you can work backwards to get delta G, right? Because you could do E negative delta G over R T. So if you could measure K and you know what R and T are, then you actually know what delta G is as well. So this when they say equatorial axial ratio at equilibrium, this is at a specific temperature. Um, so probably room temperature is not specified, but the two com most common reference points are 25 Celsius or zero Celsius. Since we're not dealing with atmospheric chemistry, this probably uh, at 25 Celsius, if I had to guess. What's the distribution of um, like bowed and chair poppers? Is it like the same thing where the chair one is really high too? Um, I, the number, what I believe is about 17 kilojoules per mole difference. Oh, I mean like the ratio. So we can work that out if we know that it's, um, if we know it's about 20 kilojoules per mole, that's 2.0 times 10 to the four joules per mole over uh, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin and 298 Kelvin. So we get something like pretty close to, let's see, so 8 times 300 is 2400, so about 10 e to the minus 10 ish. And I'm not going to estimate e to the minus 10 in my head. So, but. <laughs> You're going over seven, so. One over e to the 10, yeah, but it's still really small. Yeah, it's like 0 0.003. So it's like almost one of the 333, something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's relatively small as far as equilibrium constants goes. Remember from Gen Chem, we saw equilibrium constants where we were talking about 10 to the 30 or 10 to the minus 30. Um, so all things considered, that's not that big of a swing, but it's still a thousand to one. Um, favoring being in the chair conformer versus the bow. So that's why we mostly only look at the chair conformer. Exactly. Because it'll, it'll go to the boat, but then it'll immediately move back to one of the chair conformers pretty quickly. Um, because there's less of a transition state barrier. But as I recall, 298 is 25C, right? Correct. Okay. So this barrier was about 39 kilojoules per mole. And this distance here was that 20 kilojoules per mole. That means going from the chip the twist chair back to or sorry, the twist boat back to the chair um, only has a barrier of 19 kilojoules per mole. So that's really going to happen pretty quickly. So if it's if 39 kilojoules per mole is reasonable at room temperature going this way, going that way is going to be even faster. So you'll reach equilibrium pretty quickly. And if you look at an individual molecule, 
it won't on average won't stay in the twist boat for very long. It'll go to the twist boat and then immediately move to the other twist boat and then over this way, or it'll move back down that way um, relatively quickly. It's like a split. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Say. Like one of those wristband snapper things. Yeah, you're putting it into your <laughs> that's a, that's actually a good analogy. Those when you straighten those wristband things out, those snap bracelets, um, which have made a comeback from my childhood. <laughs> For whatever reason. Um, my daughter has a bunch of those. When you straighten them out, it is a local minimum in terms of potential energy service, but it won't stay there that long usually. If you bump it like at all, basically it goes to its global minimum, which is curled up. So this is like, okay, if it's curled up, if you shake it hard, picture just picking one end of that when it's curled up and just shaking it, there's a decent chance that at some point it'll straighten as you're shaking it. But then as you continue shaking it, it'll go right back to where it was before. So it'll straighten for a second, hit that local minimum, and then, but because once we get to a local minimum, it's not like then we drop the temperature immediately and freeze it. And so it'll just wind up going back where it was because everything's shaking constantly at the molecular level at room temperature. I like the, the bracelets analogy is a good one as a spring. I like that. All right, and so, this is also a good, this table is also a good way to estimate roughly how big things are. Like an OH group is bigger than a chlorine. A methyl group is bigger than an OH group. An ethyl group is actually doesn't look that much bigger than a methyl group because the, that second carbon can basically stay rotated out of the way. So basically an ethyl group and a methyl group are close to the same size. An isopropyl group it's a little bit harder to keep the whole thing rotated out of the way. And a T-butyl group is really hard because there's basically no way to keep the whole molecule out of the way. But they kind of go the way we'd expect once we start adding more carbons. On the more carbons you add, the more steric interference you get, the larger these diaxial interactions are. And the larger the diaxial interactions are, the bigger deal it is to keep them out of the way. So the lower number is a bigger... Small, bigger atom. So a lower, a bigger number here means you're less likely to find it in the axial. Because this is basically raising up those barriers to go from, from one chair conformer to the other chair conformer. We no longer have a symmetrical, I'm going to draw the simplified potential energy surface. <laughs> It's not symmetrical anymore if our two chair conformers are not identical. And so the difference between these two is this number. Gotcha. And so if it's just a chlorine replacing a hydrogen, then this difference is only two kilojoules per mole. So in that case, our K value is not that big, which is why you wind up with a 70-30. It's not that far off of a 50-50 ratio, right? Because the difference in these heights relative to each other is pretty small. As the difference in height gets bigger, so as we go down this table, our ratio favors putting that, that substituent in the equatorial position more and more. So I have to label this, this is the, the equatorial configuration. This is the axial, where you're putting the substituent in the axial. And this relative height is what goes into our K equation here. Right, so the bigger, the one, three diaxial interactions, the more we favor keeping that substituent in the equatorial position. So going from equatorial to equatorial to axial would be like rolling up to that snap in the opposite. Exactly, end. putting the energy in to straighten it. And then it uncurling and going back the other way is going back to equilibrium. Does 
there's a lot of numbers on this chart, but the basic point of this is just put your largest substituent in the equatorial position to find the most stable complement. All right, so let's talk about dye substituted a little bit more. Dye substituted um, rings, we have a restricted rotation. You have just um, sigma bonds between all these different atoms, but we can't just freely rotate them anymore the way we did with our Newman projections in the past because we have this, these two pieces are connected in this ring structure, which can be convenient to draw it as a plane, even though it's really in its chair conformer or a boat conformer, it still, can still be convenient to draw it as a flat hexagon for the sake of trying to show how this works. But basically, the two possibilities are if you have two substituents on a ring, they can be on the same side of the ring, or they can be on opposite sides of the ring. All right, and this is this is referred to as cis trans isomerism. Cis means the same, trans means across. So these two methyls are in cis configuration. And it's not really just a complement, it's actually a different molecule. Because to take this, um, this cis configuration and get trans out of it, we actually have to break a bond, break two bonds, and then reform them. Cis would be dual axial. So let's let's try drawing these. If we try to draw these as if we took this, this is going to be the best way to do it. If we take this corner and make this the point of our chair, then our our other one, our we have an axial going straight down or an equatorial coming straight out towards us. And, and then this would be the hydrogen, this would be a hydrogen. So this would be the cis conformer puts one of them axial and one of them equatorial when they're adjacent to each other. As soon as they're like one, three, then it, then it flips again where they're on the same plane. Exactly. So if they're one, three, because the, if they're on the same side now, one, three being cis means they're running into each other with that cis, that one, three diaxial interactions. So basically to predict whether they're both going to be axial or one's axial and one's equatorial, you kind of have to draw it out. Uh, and that's why getting used to drawing these, these um, cyclohexanes and where all of the So can I say that a, a cis always has scattered isomerism where a trans would be? No, because it depends on how close they are to each other. Right. If one and two are cis, then they're going to be axial and equatorial. But if one and three are cis, they can both be axial or both equatorial. Okay. So I'm going to draw the, the axials in red. Okay, so the, there's only like if they're right next to each other or if there's like a gap in between each other. It does alternate. You just have to pay attention to that. So if you look at where the red ones are, the ones that are both axial, if they're adjacent, the axial positions are cis to each other. But if you're one, three, the axial positions are cis. If it's one, four, now we're flipped again. Because if you look at one, four, our two axial positions up and down are on opposite sides of the ring when you view it from above. Uh -huh. Right, so if I took this, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna rotate it, so I'm looking at it from directly above, and I'm going to try to draw 
the axial and equatorial positions again. So Right, so see how our axials are in red, they're pointed on opposite sides of the ring when they're adjacent, or when it's one four. When it's one three, our axials are six relative to each other. Right, and same with our equatorials. When they're adjacent, axial and equatorial are trans. When it's one, three, equatorials, the equatorials are cis relative to each other. So it takes getting used to when it comes to, and frankly, learning how to draw this and getting, getting down how to draw the axial and equatorial positions and color, color coding can really help with that to keep track of things. Um, but if we're trying to draw, and that's why I, I tried to give you one that was relatively easy on the quiz, since we hadn't covered this in detail yet, I gave you one where it was kind of easy to see one has to be axial, one has to be equatorial, and we didn't worry about words like cis and trans yet. Every, if the chair flip happens, it, axial goes to axial. Exactly. All of the axials and equatorials flip when you do a chair flip. Because if you can picture taking this corner and rotating it down so that you're temporarily in the boat configuration, this red one that was an axial, once you flip it down into the boat configuration, this red piece rotates into the axial. So let's draw the chair flip here. And I'm going to keep the color coding. And the reds and the blues, the reds are axial. The reds will end up being equatorial after our chair flip. So our first part of our chair flip is we're going to take this point, the headrest, and we're going to flip it down. I'm going to draw it a little bit smaller because I'm going to leave room to draw the, the other chair version. So nothing changed on the left half of the molecule, right? So the left half of the molecule looks the same. On the right half of the molecule, by rotating it down, that brings this blue one kind of down with it, and the red one flips the other way. So blue's our axial position. So now on the right half, blue is our axial, and our equatorial. And then we wound up with that one. The, it's easiest to see it on the headrests. And then when we flip the other side up, we get that same inversion of the axial and equatorial. That, this is even a, a good exercise for me because I have to be really careful with how I'm drawing these. Yeah. 
this is also a good um, it makes the point really clear. It's a lot easier to draw the axials than the equatorials. So it's usually better to draw your axials first because then you can figure out, okay, well, my equatorials just have to go where the other three bonds aren't. Um, for me, like dismembering departments, I had an easier time seeing what's happening. Because it's like, if you start one in the top right corner, all the, one, all the odd ones flip. Right, exactly. So it's just something that takes practice and and work on visualizing it. And there's some good, there's a really good uh, animation on Come to 3D is made by the University of Leeds in England. Um, and they have some really good. On here. So there's confirmations of butene, butane. There we go. Cyclohexane confirmations. So it'll actually show it to you in 3D and you can click and drag around. So it's in chair confirmation right now. You can flip it up. Now we're in their vote confirmation, and then we can flip the other side down. Yeah, it's it's a little bit jerky. <laughs> um, all of those have to be generated by hand. So since this is just a bunch of grad students that maintain this on their own with very little funding. Um, at one point, somebody put in the time to make a 20 frame animation and then has not maintained it since. So, <laughs> and I know because I've done that too. Um, incidentally, this is this is actually the same uh, the same Java app that Moleview uses. Jmol is an open source Java based 3D molecule viewer that does some basic calculations as well. So, so Moleview has this embedded as the, as the um, right-hand side of the screen. Uh, and a lot of people that do computational chemistry and animations use JMOL as well, because it's a pretty, it's relatively well-supported and, um, and it's open source. There are nicer programs out there, but they don't let you do things like embed it in your website for free. Um, so JMOL is kind of the go-to for those. When we get to OCHEM 3, we'll actually do some computational chemistry labs where we actually, I actually have to calculate some of these and we can actually make our own potential energy surface and calculate the energy for something simple like the rotation of cyclobutane. Um, but this is also interesting um, page if you are into um, minerals because a lot of the inorganic stuff does some really interesting crystal structures like fluorite or cadmium iodide or anatase um, and things like that. But if you're into the, the uh, geology side, it's interesting as well. But where is... Carbene? Oh, that's why. What's carbene? A carbene, I believe is a... Is that a free radical or is that a carbon ion? I have to double check that. It's an obscure, not quite a functional group because it's very unstable. But it's an intermediate in some of the um, reactions that we'll look at in third third quarter, probably. Um, oh, so that's, that's why I want stereoselectivity. I want stereochemistry. It says neutral divalent. Carbon species containing two electrons that are not shared. Neutral divalent carbon species. So it's neutral, but it doesn't have full valence. So it's not an anion. Yeah. It has unpaired electrons as a lone pair. Um, there we go. So here's confirmations of butane. And it has the potential energy surface. We'll actually generate this ourselves.
So there's to our, our stagnant or our eclipsed configuration. There's our gauche configuration. There's our other eclipse configuration. And so you can see that basically what we can do is we can rotate that, that methyl around. And if we do that in a couple different steps and we calculate the energy of each of those steps, that's actually how these all how these animations are generated. And that's how these potential energy services are generated, is by just basically doing a snapshot along the way. Start rotating, you rotate it 10 degrees, and then you calculate calculate the energy of the system. Then you rotate it another 10 degrees and you calculate the energy of the system. And that's what generates these potential energy services. All right. Um, when it comes to naming these, um, when we're naming cis versus trans isomers, we just use that that prefix cis versus trans. So if we're saying it's one two dimethyl cyclohexane and they're on the same side of the ring structure, that's cis one two dimethyl cyclohexane. So for the cis, one of them would be equatorial and one of them would be hexane. Right. If it's cis one two, if it's cis one three, then they could both be equatorial. Could be, or they could both be absent. Okay, what is this could be? What's it depend on the complement. The most okay. stable complement would have them both equatorial. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, and then same same for trans. If we're saying they're on opposite sides of the ring, we just throw the word trans in front of it. So trans one two dimethyl cyclohexane versus cis one two dimethyl cyclohexane. I'm trying to read the rule for this, but it doesn't seem to be one. Really, <laughs> it's it's it alternates. Right. So when the cis and their one two or one four, then they then they're going to be one's axial, one's equatorial, no matter what. So evens scattered axial evens alternate if it's six if it's six so okay. for six <laughs> evens alternate and um and odds are the same axial versus equatorial. Guys, we call that orientation. So I don't want to say the same side of the ring or the same. So, so when it's cis, the evens alternate orientation and the odds are the same orientation. And when it's trans, that's reversed. So when it's trans, Evens are same orientation. And the odds alternate. Is that out? I love that. Okay. <laughs> So this is in, this isn't really the I don't actually when we talk about axial versus equatorial I don't think using the word orientation to describe that is universal but it can be for our class you can say gender for it <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> but it's I mean this is actually where the term cis and trans came from originally trans transgender was has always used that term trans to mean across or changing. Um, and then somebody noticed that they, we already had in the language in chemistry, cis was already mean, meant not trans. So it actually did come from the chemistry, I believe. It, the Latin backs it up as well, but I believe that that's where that 
terminology came from. It was there first. It was, it was there twice. first. And they said, well, we have trans, and then we have the opposite of trans. We call that cis because that's what chemistry does. <laughs> that's where it is. People are like, you're cis. Cis mm -hmm. that white male. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's me. <laughs> All right. Let's. So we just established our rules. Let's take a 10 minute break. And, and then uh, when you come back, try drawing both conformers, both conformers, both chair conformers for the cis, and then both conformers for the trans. And see if you can, if there's a difference, you should be able to use those rules we just established, but try drawing it and showing the work for it when we get back. So when you can do that now, or you can do that when you come back from your break, either way. And I'll start talking about it in at uh, 11. Images and the dash lines. So, like, um, I know that, like, you do the ring flip, but like, especially for trans, like, it's one of the problems on the quiz was like, it was a tri mental group. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, I, I, that's where I was kind of getting confused because I, I knew what the two were, but I wasn't sure, like, if it was protruding out like a full line, so like, where it would be on the chair conformer. It might help as well when you draw to draw the wedges on your on your cyclohexane ring structure too. Okay. Because that'll actually help you show, okay, this one's from, from carbon one of the point. This bond is coming out towards me, and this bond is going away. Therefore, my other two are in the plane of the board. Mm -hmm. right. And so then it can be from, from this carbon down here. It's going back there. And then here, that's a wedge. Uh, it does help, just because I feel like in the text, it doesn't do dash lines. So exactly, it's hard to know where it's actually going. Right. So then. So then for this one, the edges are the easiest ones, right? Because because the substituents are planar mm -hmm. because you're you've got your in out of the board and into the board already drawn. For this carbon, you've got carbon going or a bond going away from it and one that's flat. So where do the other two have to go? Well, the, the other one that's flat is going to go roughly 120 degrees to this one that's flat. We just wind up drawing more like a 90 degrees to give ourselves more room to show this other stuff. And the bond that's coming out of the board even more is the same general orientation as the one going to the back there. It takes practice to be able to see it. And there's, this is why we don't use the wedges and dashes on the actual ring structure all the time because it looks starts looking really crowded. Um, but if you can find your axials, your axials are always going to be in the plane of the board. So figure out where your axials go and where it'd be helpful if I color coded it. And now you've got three of your bonds drawn on all of those. And now figuring out where the fourth one goes, the equatorial position is a little bit easier to see. So for this one, you've got a bond going away, a bond in the plane, a bond in the plane. So my other one has to be coming out in the same general direction here. Okay, gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah. Always go back to those tetrahedral shapes the the most common way we draw them is two bonds flat one out and one in and the one out and one in are generally are in the same general quadrant if you want to call it that so 
then in the back, the one that would go even further back would be in the same one as because this dotted line is actually coming forward from the back of carbon. In the plane, in the plane, the last one is going even further back in the same general direction as this one. That was a little. It's hard that's to think messy. of. That's a messy one. I was going to say. Because I'm like, yeah, maybe it's just the look of it. You did make the point that that's why we don't use those words. Exactly. In the, exactly. Yeah, there it is. If we're drawing this, I'm going to try to arrange it so it's still close to the same plane. Oh, okay, now I see that one. Okay. That one's kind of in the same general direction as the other carbon, but into the board even further. Gotcha, yeah. I mean, once, once you get this kind of in your head, then drawing it with just lines starts to make more sense. But you've got to be able to see it like this first, or it's just impossible. Which, and again, remind me when we get into lab today and we'll pull out the, um, the molecular modeling kits and you can build a cyclohexane and you can, you can hold it in your hands. You can pop off a hydrogen and put a methyl group on it and then actually do a chair flip and, and hold it in your hands when you're doing that. And that can actually help, help a lot to see what's going on. They ever made one with magnets where the bigger substituents would have more uh, polar and if you we just we just represent it by building the whole thing out, and you can kind of see the same general. But yes, they have what they call they're not using magnets, but they call have what they call space filling models oh. that are instead of a ball and stick, it's a bunch of larger spheres that kind of that you kind of glom onto each other. Hmm. That could might even be a that's the whole view. That's what whole view shows is the three different. You can't. So here's space fill. Yeah, there is. Yeah. So that's more what it would actually look like. You can see the one three diaxial interactions. This hydrogen, these these two three hydrogens are all pointed in the same direct direction, right? If one of them was a larger object, it's going to push on those hydrogens even more. And then when you're even larger molecules, the stick can be really helpful. I like the, the ball and stick is a nice middle ground between those two still shows a little bit of the size, but you can still see the bonds um, and what's going on a little bit easier. Um, and Molview, if you look up methyl cyclohexane, Molview will give you the 3D structure and you can click and drag around, except it doesn't do the multiple confirmations. It'll just give show you one of them, probably with it in the equatorial position. Um, but it doesn't have, that's where these chem to chem to 3D is superior in, with these 3D molecules is in showing them. Chem tube 3D, I usually use it to teach crystal structures because it does crystal structures really well too. So like, you want to see something like, uh, oh, it's the whole crystal unit from Right, exactly. A lot of the structures have more in this. So it shows face centered cubics pretty well and click and drag. And then you can see things like do you remember doing the tetrahedral holes or the octahedral holes? Yeah. So, anyway, um, Chem2, it does also have a fair bit of organic stuff and it, and it shows those pretty well and we'll actually use them at pretty well um, when we start looking at reactions too because they've gone through and added a bunch of the reaction pathways showing the 3D shape as well. And for some of these even... Was this the website that you showed the different periodic tables? No, so that's P table. P table, okay. Um, and if you just Google periodic table, that's the first one that shows. Oh, wait, you mean the like the database of all the funky ones? Yeah, the different ones that you're showing. No, that one was 
using medicines. If you Google alternate periodic tables, that one should show up. Okay. Or even start, if you start from the Wikipedia page, alternate periodic tables. Um, so there's types of periodic tables, and then from here, there's a um, there's a link to some of these other ones. Uh, there it is. Internet database of periodic tables. Chemogenesis webbook. I can never remember what this one's called, but uh, but if you yeah. Google alternative periodic tables, it's one of the top ones that shows up. I don't blame you for not remembering that. <laughs> There's a lot of these. I was actually kind of surprised myself I could remember Chem 2 3D because I like I said I reference that about twice a year. Um, but and I always get lost in these. He likes their three-dimensional periodic tables when viewed from above. Uh, there's some really cool ones here. I want to do a um, I want to 3D print one because there's some cool 3D formulations here. This one's just you print it and then tape it together. I didn't tape it together. Anyway, all right. Let's try drawing these if you haven't yet. We'll confirm our suspicions, the rule we came up with on the last slide. It's easy to flip everything around, but I know where to put things just to begin with. Right. That's sort of why I wanted the rules, because I couldn't picture it. So I'm going to do this, this one first, and I'm going to try and stay color a bit. So. If they're cis and they're adjacent, the next door axial is going to be straight down. Because remember, our, our axials are always in the plane of the board, which means our equatorial is coming out towards us. So does everybody see how that, if you took this and just flattened it out to look like this, how they would be cis, both of the methyls, if we flattened this chair out, both of the methyls would be above the hexagon and both of the hydrogens would be below the hexagon. So it doesn't look cis when it's drawn in the chair conformer. You have to use your imagination to see how this is actually cis. And for me, at least, the way that I find it easiest is to just picture taking the point of the headrest here and flattening out this carbon, the red carbon here would still be above the plane of the hexagon. And when we flatten it out, that's actually gonna push this one up a little bit because now this bond is in the way. If you make it go planar, then this uh, methyl group is sticking up like this. I just think it would be um, like in that bottom left corner, just to put like the way the it's shown. This bottom left corner. Yeah, I'm just trying to like number the carbon atoms because I would, I always try to start like on the top. Right. right. So if we call that carbon one. Mm -hmm. So then carbon four. Its axial position is going to be going straight down. Its equatorial position this way. I mean, like in the skeletal structure, like isn't it um, four and five? Oh, these two? Yeah. I would still call them one and two because they're adjacent to each okay, other. Okay, so you can just kind of like, I guess that's where I was going to go. Yeah. 
They do that as long as they're right next to each other. We can we can call call whatever carbon we want one, and then we just have to start counting whichever way is convenient to keep the numbers low. Just just like we did when it was a chain. Um, count from wherever is convenient. When it's a chain, it still has to be at the end. Yep, but you could count call either end carbon one. The ring doesn't have an end, so you pick one of the ones that has a substituent, and that's carbon one. And then if it's adjacent, it's one, two. This position be one, four. When we do a chair, so here we have one axial and one, one equatorial. And if we do a chair flip, all of our axials and equatorials split, right? So I mean, we're thinking the one next to it, like this one. Yeah, that would still be one, two. This would be if there were the other methyl group was here mm -hmm. instead of there. Yeah. Then we would still call that one too. Okay. That would look more like what this, the way this is drawn. Um, but I always like using the points of the of the chair conformer because there's easier to draw your axle and equatorial because they're both planar. So but if I if I was gonna redraw it that way, yeah, yeah, I'd like to see that. It's the same shape we just heard. We're not trying, drawing it for our reference point, which are right. the points where the head rest. So if both of them were up, then one of our methyls is there and the other one is here. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, totally. Okay. So in, they're still both above. If we flatten this back out, they both would be above the plane of the of the hexagon. So they're still cis. And again, that that gets. I lost my color coding here. Um, this one would be the equatorial. Our equatorial here is a hydrogen sticking out towards us. Our axial here is a hydrogen sticking straight down. So they're still roughly in the same shape as they were right here, right? When we, when we pick this up, this one kind of rotates out towards us a little bit. And when we pick, push this one down, this one kind of stays in that up and down position. This hydrogen winds up matching it. When we do chair push, would you like to see the boat? Confirmation as well. Or? If, if it's helpful to you, and once you're comfortable drawing the chair flips, you don't need to show the boat. Because our chair flip here is just going to look like now we've got our methyl group here. And our other methyl group is right here. So we still wind up with one axial and one equatorial after we do the chair flip. So in other words, for these ones, because they're the same size, and we're all, no matter what conformer we're in, we've got one axial, one equatorial. So these ones don't have a preferred conformer. The equilibrium constant between these two states is one. You'll have a 50, 50 if you could even tell the difference between them, you would have a 50 50 mixture of the two. So would, the, would it be symmetrical, the surface? The surface would be symmetrical, yes. It's kind of like resonance one. It's right. Like we have, we have several there. options that are all the same energy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, except the difference with equilibrium is that it actually will physically move. Resonance, everything's happening at once simultaneously because of the way electrons behave. These actually do flicker back and forth between these at a measurable speed. So that's the big difference between equilibrium and resonance is that resonance is a mixture of all of the 
all of the electronic states that can happen simultaneously, but equilibrium is actual atoms moving. Well, I mean, nothing can happen simultaneously. It does though. But that's just as far as we can measure, right? No. Remember back to uh, when we when we were looking at quantum. Remember the the Bohr model. We had the, the nucleus, and then we had n equals one and n equals two. When you promote an electron, you need to shine light on it. We just abbreviate as H nu. You can promote an electron from n equals one to n equals two. Those are different physical spaces. And it's not like the electron, and the electron literally cannot exist between n equals one and n equals two. There is no n equals one and a half. There is not a stable situ or a stable solution to the Schrodinger's equation that so allows for it to exist. In one or in two. Exactly. And so how does it get from one to two then? It ceases to exist in n equals one and it begins existing in n equals two simultaneously. As far as we know, the math backs it up, and well, because that, because that's like, a lot of bullshit up, so let's not go there. <laughs> so no, there we have. It is an, it is a simultaneous. It's faster than the speed of light. Okay, so we just are not able to see this kind of stuff. Well, nothing can be faster than the speed of light. As so far faster as than the, the, this is always just as far as humans know. Have you ever heard of like Heisenberg uncertainty principle? Uh, no, what is it good? Well, I think that's like what it comes down to, right? In a lot of ways, where my whole idea is Murphy's law, anything that can happen will happen. And if it if it's just too low, so but but that's the key. It can't happen. It can, electrons cannot exist in between these two levels, which means that it doesn't matter how fast it moves, it can't be there. Which means the only way for it to move from from n equals one to n equals two is for it to teleport, if you want to call it that. Right. I was just about to get to that. Okay. That's not really simultaneous. Like I'm talking about two electrons existing simul simultaneously in the same space, or a photon and electron well, existing simultaneously. It's a it's a delta function in math terms. It goes from it's discontinuous in terms of you can't take the derivative. Uh, it's got a, a corner to it. Basically, it, you don't see both electrons existing simultaneously. At the exact instant it stops existing in one place, it begins existing somewhere else. So it's as far as we can tell, it's the same electron because mathematically it has to be. But it, it's not like it traveled from point A to point B, and it's not like it exists in two spaces at the same time either. So it's weird. So that's that's what I mean when when going back to your original question, was is it actually just fast too fast for us to see? No, electrons actually behave in this weird way where they be they exist as a superposition of waves of probabilities, which means resonance is not just flickering back and forth too fast for us to see, it literally is both. So the way we understand electrons is using statistics. Partially. Uh, that hurts <laughs> to hear. Um, so, so I mean, we can we can make it worse, but also explain it better. Uh -huh. um, it's actually not the the uh, wave function uh, for a particular system of electrons is a series of functions that are that are arranged in a matrix, where every element in the matrix. Every row in the matrix represents an electron, and every column represents a orbital that it could be in. Good. Um, and really, each of those is a weight on a complex function that involves, um, th that is the actual orbital shape in 3D in, in complex space. So it's a matrix made up of weights and those weights are applied to these complex functions and we mix these complex functions together to approximate where the electron actually is. The electron doesn't actually know how to do any of this, obviously. Right. The electron just is. Yeah. 
And so those and electrons are bound into those shapes and those shapes are represented by here's three possible resonance structures that are all the same energy. Therefore, it's a mixture of 0.33 on this function times plus 0.33 on this function plus 0.33 on this function. And when you do that and add them together, you get a hybrid orbital that looks like all three of them mixed together. And so that's why resonance is not the same as equilibrium because equilibrium, you can actually look at it and look at the shape and say, it's this form or it's that form. You can't isolate one resonance structure. When you have an electron in a resonance system, it has to be all of them. So when you're you doing like a, a chair flip, it's not, it's yeah. not teleporting from correct. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not it's, an electron. It's actually moving. And right. It's going to be a right. definite change. Exactly. Okay. And we can actually see that because, and I'm going to use some terms that Christelle, you and Edward haven't heard yet, but the stereochemistry in terms of R's and S's, this has two asymmetric carbons. It's meso, but it has two asymmetric carbons. Um, and when you do the chair flip, you can actually isolate which stereo center it is. And so we can actually see it's RR versus, or it's RS versus SR. And we can actually see that. So we know it's physically switching back and forth, even though our molecule is symmetric, because we're seeing both stereo isomers. Gotcha. And there's no real electron changes here. There's, there's no electron changes. This is just common. The electrons are following along. The yeah. bonds are following along where the atoms are moving. We get to electrons. <laughs> because we've mentioned <laughs> resonance and how right, right, the right. difference that's between it, it. resonance and equilibrium. They're related and they're kind of similar concepts. One last off-topic question. How okay. do we know the difference between two electrons? Saying that they're we not don't. identical. We don't. So how are you supposed to say that? When I asked you a question previously, about and I said, resonance, assuming it's the same electron, you said that the two electrons that are in the lowest orbital don't get, they're not involved in resonance, but how are you to say that they're not teleporting simultaneously? So, <laughs> so, but, so this is where it gets really interesting. And this is something that this makes the math work. So theoretical physicists, there is a school in theoretical physics, physics that um, suggests that there only exists one electron in the universe. And it just, and it exists in all of these systems simultaneously because electrons don't have to follow the sun laws of cause and effect that, that normal things are because the electrons cease to exist in one place. So what's electricity then? Exactly. <laughs> <Don't>, but, <laughs> But that's the point is, is because it doesn't follow our regular rules for causality, for cause and effect, because it can cease to exist in one place and start to exist in another place, there's nothing preventing it from being in the same point in time in different physical spaces. And again, it makes the math work. <laughs> so the physicist is like, well, there's nothing to rule it out. Hmm. But if electrons are, if quantum particles are not bound by time the same way that macroscopic objects are, then there's nothing to prevent it, something, a case like that from happening. I'm going to put you to sleep with this today. <laughs> Either that or it's going to put you to sleep really well. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Albert Einstein really hated all this too. Like when quantum mechanics is being developed, right. you didn't stand it, you know, because it really it, it kind of showed that the universe was chaotic and unpredictable. But that's, that's not, the nature of it. I mean, right. it's, we're just using reference points. Like, we can't say any of this is real because we're just measuring things. No, we, we can't say it. Even we can say that the behavior is real. We can't necessarily say exactly. that. And even, even combining the orbitals, it's not like I said before. It's not like the electron actually knows how to do complex linear algebra right. to, to mix its orbitals together and say, oh, this is where I should be. It's like, it's just the way that the universe behaves. And we use these complex functions and mixing them together and these matrices as a way of explaining and predicting the behavior of the universe. Um, and, it, and they are, I was, where Einstein gets misrepresented, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too when I teach to the Gen Chem students, 
Um, Einstein didn't just say that quantum can't be true. Quant Einstein said that there must be some underlying or happening behind the scenes that we don't have a way to measure yet. And that's why it appears random. He was, he was a believer that there had to be something else behind quantum that would remove the randomness. That's sort of, uh, you know, the electrons simultaneously. Right. You're going to say they're teleporting, then why can't they teleport simultaneously to the same exact positions? Exactly. So that's that was Einstein's contention, and and basically that there has to be something, quote unquote, behind the curtain that's directing this randomness. But he based that not on any evidence, but based on the fact he didn't like the idea of a random universe. Right. And that's where it ceases to be science and starts to be philosophy. Mm -hmm because there's no way of measuring that. And everybody else is like, well, we don't know what's behind the curtain, Einstein, but we can do these really cool calculations if we just ignore the behind the curtain for now until somebody comes up with a good way to measure it. Um, and that's, you know, they, Einstein really disliked the fact that instead of continuing to try and look behind the curtain during the Manhattan Project and in the early 1900s, everybody went to, well, what does that matter? We can do really cool stuff and measure really cool things and make computers and transistors and stuff like that now because of quantum. So they, the new school of computation of uh, quantum physicists, um, basically they stop asking those philosophical questions. Shut up and compute is was what was the phrase that was used. Stop talking to me about that, Einstein. I'm busy trying to do math over here. Well, logic is philosophy. And if you're going to use logic to try to back up any kind of claim, then you're using philosophy. If you say that we're not going to talk about anything philosophical, then you're not trying to talk about any of this at all. Right. And that's, and that's where there was a, a fundamental disconnect, why Einstein got so pissy about it. Um, Here's with, have a lot of fun when you watch this. <laughs> it's like, so the, the other aspect to it is... Um, it's hard to use logical rules when causality doesn't exist. If there's no such thing as cause and effect for certain particles in the universe, then can you even use logical rules to, to make any of these arguments? Because there's this randomness aspect and like the other place that this happens is on the surface of a black hole. On the surface of a black hole, the density is such that space time and space time is warped such that causality doesn't exist. All things happen simultaneously, but the word simultaneously doesn't even make any sense because time doesn't exist. So it's just everything exists on the surface and it, anything that happens on the surface, you can't even say that it happens because that implies time. Basically, we don't have the language to describe it. A, set, a system that doesn't have time, right? Because all of our language is based around verbs. Verbs imply action. Action implies change. Change implies causality. You don't have that on the surface of a black hole, so you can't use logical rules. You just did, though. <laughs> because I'm really fucking <laughs> That's the best. The, it's a it, what is it? It's a, it's it's circular to some extent, and yeah. it's 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 contradictory in a lot of ways because we don't one our brains evolved in in the existence of cause and effect, <laughs> so we, we naturally think that way, and our language as well evolved in in a, because of our brains, and our brains are based on cause and effect. So we literally don't have a way to really think about the absence of cause and effect, other than to say you can't use logical rules because you can't say if this, then that, right. because if then, that's cause and effect. Right. That doesn't exist on the surface of a black hole or for electrons in some instances. So, so I don't do that. That. Back on track. <laughs> that's okay because we, for the most part, uh, that was the biggest things that I wanted to get through today was talking about these different conformers. So let's look at another di substituted cycle. Okay, start, start with this one's trans, still one, two. Start by drawing both possible conformers and let's figure out which one of them, if 
and this one's asymmetric. So one of these conformers will be favored. Since you're done drawing, it, remind me at the end of the class if you want to ask me about how the lack of causality affects the Big Bang, because the Big Bang was a singularity like a black hole. Yeah, if you're interested, <laughs> you don't have to, obviously. I am but... very interested, but I feel like we're going to go down a black hole ourselves. <laughs> it's okay, we've got the time for it today. All right, let's. Um, so, the way that I typically draw these is I don't like putting substance on the back of the molecule if I can avoid it because that starts looking too cluttered for me. So I'm going to take the chlorine and make that the point of my chair. So I just took this and I sort of rotated it and flipped that up. So now the chlorine is still is above the plane of the hexagon, right? So the way it's drawn I've drawn chlorine in the axial configuration. The methyl is below the plane. So they're both axial, the way I've drawn them. If we do a chair flip, what happens? We wind up with them both being equatorial. So if they're on carbon one and two and they're trans, they're either both axial or both equatorial. If there are carbons one and two, and they're cis, one can be axial and one sectory. So out of these, which is the more stable conformer? Equatorial. Yeah, the one where they're both equatorial. And that seems contradictory. Because this one visually looks like they're away from everything else more, right? Right. The one three. But we're leaving off those one three interactions. We're leaving off those other hydrogens on there. That those are the ones that would actually be pushing into the, into the um, substituents. And when I flipped it, I had this guy here. So equatorial. They're both like the same chlorine axial, but yours, yours has, I just don't know if these are the same as what 
you've got the other stereo isomer. You've got you got the the inverted version. Oh, okay. It's just upside down. Okay. Right. Got it. Well, you've got the mirror image. Like the chlorine with the dashed line and then the is the same. Right. But we're not being specific about that. I took, I tried to visually, I took this and I rotated it 90 degrees so that we had. This and I took this molecule and I picked that corner up to make it the point. That's why the chlorine's up here, and this one has to be the front. All right, if you put it on the back carbon, it's still one, two methyl chloro. Mm -hmm. um, but the difference with that is that you have the mirror image of it, which means if the R's and the S's would be flipped. Well, if I flip it upside down. This needs to be down there, but would that still be the same? But that's so that the fact that you, you have a mirror image of it. So no matter how you flip it, because you drew the methyl behind the chlorine, not in front of the chlorine. So down there is the right. And the equatorial. Right. Got it. So when they're axial, the solid wedge is going to always be up and the dash is always going to be down. When they're I think that's what you wrote. It. Like CL is up, methyl is down. I mean, I could have taken this and rotated the other 90 degrees the other way and pulled this down to start with the chlorine equatorial that direction from the bottom corner down here instead. But if I did that, then that would mean the methyl was on this carbon here. And like I said, I don't like to use that back corner. Gotcha. The main thing is that is to just treat it like it's a physical object. If you're trying to go from here to here, take you know visualize moving this, rotating around, redraw it if you have to, like I did here. Because then I could take this and I could actually turn it on its side to draw that flat hexagon if I wanted. Because if I had that shape. Then and then the chlorine would be up here and the methyl would be down here. And then I can pick that corner up. Like I was talking about, I didn't show taking this and turning it sideways and then putting it into the chair column there. But if you remember to treat these like it's a physical object, not just a collection of lines, because everything has to stay connected when you move, when you do one of those, they call that a transform. When you shift it, rotate it twist it, everything still has to stay connected the whole time. So practice thinking about it as a physical 3D object, and that makes that a little bit easier. Even with cis isomers, it's a transform? It's a transform, yes. It's like, well, if a solid wedge is coming at you, and right. the dash line is coming away from you, I guess like with the axial, though, it doesn't really look like they're coming at or away from you. And so the axial ones are mostly in this, are parallel to the plane of the board. That's part of what makes them axial. Mm -hmm. Is in this chair conformation, the bulk of the hexagon is like this, right? This flat end of the board and out of the board, it's perpendicular to the board, which means the axial positions are either gonna be, it might be in front of the board or behind the board, but they should still be parallel to the board. Oh. So drawn more neatly with the hydrogen on there as well. Here are two possibilities. Right, and the one on the right has both of them, the chlorine and the methyl equatorial. And again, if without the wedges and dashes, it would be difficult to see that, but always remember that the axial should be close to straight up and straight down. If the axis, so it's easy to locate the axial position, and then just remember that the other one is equatorial.
All right, so a few other key points. Um, a side note on scheduling. Uh, the test midterm will be a week from Thursday. We're in week six already. So the end of week seven, a week from Thursday, will be the, the in-class test. We have only midterm. We don't have to take home midterm. Um, so that means on Thursday, your and your homework over the weekend won't be a quiz. It'll be working on practice test. So I'll have a practice test for you on Thursday. Work on it over the weekend. Tuesday will be review. If there's any, if there's a few more slides I need to um, get through before before um, our test, we might have like a, a partial lecture on Monday um, or on Tuesday. I mean. Um, and but then we have we don't have lab next week scheduled so so we have the whole lab period next week to just do review and work on on the practice test ask questions that kind of thing so you should you have lots of time to ask me questions and then the Thursday will be the test um today for lab just today for lab we have a, the first part of the two week lab so we're just we're going to do over three weeks. So we'll finish up today's lab after the test. Okay. Um, but it's basically we're gonna we're gonna do our first synthesis today, and then we're gonna save what we make, and then we're gonna do we're gonna clean it up and purify it um, two weeks from now. Cool. And so, but next week we don't have we will I will be here for lab. You can come ask questions, and we'll go over the practice test as much as you want. Um, but we won't have an official lab meeting. Is today's lab up on Canvas or is that just going to be? I believe it is, but I'll make sure that it, that I get published um, when we end the class here. All right, and the reason that this page reminded me of that is because one of the problems is going to be um, here's the molecular formula: draw all the constitutional isomers. So if it's C three H H seven Br, how many different isomers are there? How many different ways can you arrange that to get different compounds? Um, but then the other way is if there are um, so constitutional isomers means we have the same molecular isomer always means the same molecular formula. A constitutional isomer means we actually have different bonds. So here we have two carbon oxygen bonds in the ethanol. We only have one carbon oxygen bond. Those are constitutional isomers because we actually have different functional groups, different connectivity. A stereoisomer just means it's you have the same bonds, but different orientations of some of them. So cis versus trans is the classic example. Because cis 2 butene versus trans 2 butene, or cis 1 2 dimethylcyclohexane versus trans 1 2 dimethylcyclohexane. They're both dimethylcyclohexane, but by, by having that hindered rotation, you can wind up creating stereoisomers. All right, and we do actually see a difference in the properties. Cis-2-butene boils at four Celsius versus trans-2-butene boils at one Celsius. They're close, but they're definitely not the same molecule. And you definitely you can't convert back and forth between cis two butene and trans two butene. All right, so and we're going to get into alkenes a little bit, which is what we get. That's the functional group. Remember when we have a one sigma bond and one pi bond between two carbons, that gives us an alkene. All right, and so just like the ring structures. Alkenes also have a hindered rotation, meaning you can't freely rotate a pi bond the way you can a sigma bond. And so for if, with a sigma bond, all three of these positions around that carbon are identical. You can rotate this around however you want. You know, if I, if I drew... molecule like this, I can take this molecule and I can twist this however I want to, like a like a fan blade. When there's a pi bond involved, you can't. 
What's different about a pi bond? The uh, y axis of the atom connected, so you can't rotate that without torsional force. So the p orbitals? Is that is the p orbitals? The p orbitals exist above and below. <laughs> so, in, in mathematical terms, the, the sigma bond is rotationally symmetrical. In other words, you get the same amount of orbital overlap no matter which way things are spinning because it's the same shape spun around, right? As soon as you make a pi bond, though, because pi bonds exist above and so far sigma bonds here, those ones are the ones that can rotate no matter what. Because they're just balloon shaped and they overlap with each other, it doesn't really matter which way things are rotated when it comes to a sigma bond. But pi bonds, because they have this above and below factor, you can't twist one of the carbons without breaking that orbital overlap. And so we actually do see difference in molecule. It's not just like there's, a, it's not a conformational change um, because you actually literally have to break this bond in order to go from the cis to the trans. Right? And that's similar to cyclo groups. Cyclo groups, this sigma bond here is also rotationally symmetrical, but because the rest of the molecule isn't, you can't take the right half of the molecule and twist it around without breaking one of these other bonds. You can't twist, twist these alkenes around without breaking the pi bond. Right? And so that's what's re referred to as a either a hindered rotation or a restricted rotation. Hindered just means restricted, right? Like if you hindered somebody's progress on the marathon, you could, you could say tripping somebody was hindering their progress, not really stopping them, but you're slowing them down. Anybody try to drive around town on Saturday and Sunday? Apparently there was some issue with getting the permits and they had to change the marathon route. So they actually had to run through town, like snake their way up and down all the different blocks because they couldn't leave city limits <laughs> um, because they, the parks department canceled one of their permits for going up to Emerald Bay or something like that. So apparently the town was driving around town this weekend was even more of a mess than it normally would be on a marathon weekend. You get a permit to go running up the highway? To, to close the roads and have um, police at the crossings to, to manage the traffic. Right on. And Emerald Bay is part of the state park. And Emerald Bay is part of the state park. Yeah, there was some weirdness with the way that they did it that caused half of their permits to get canceled, um, but not Fridays or Thursdays. So, I don't know. Um, I I just know what I hear the second hand. Anyway. But hindered rotation. That hinders, your, your that hinders my knowledge, but I don't really know what's going on. <laughs> um, all right, so hindered rotations cause stereoisomers. There's another way that you can have a stereoisomer that's all sigma bonds as well. And it's not because of a hindered rotation. It's because we can attach four things to a carbon, but we live in three-dimensional space. And that means that if you think about attaching four different substituents to a single point in space, if I started by saying, okay, A, B, C, if I need to attach a fifth or a um, fourth object here, it can either be above the plane of ABC or it can be below the plane of ABC but you can't go back and forth between them without breaking bonds. Once we attach D here, I can't then say take D and then put it down below without breaking a bond. So by the nature of the, of the fact that, that these are three-dimensional molecules and we live in three-dimensional space, we can actually have things where the mirror image is not the same as the original molecule. And so the classic way to think about that is thinking about your hand. Your right hand is a mirror image of your left hand, right? Ignoring any, I don't know, freckles, scars, whatever. 
let's say that if you took the, the mirror image of your right hand, it would be indistinguishable from your left hand. But it doesn't mean that, that your right hand can fit into a left-handed glove. So you, you have the same five fingers, but the order is different in three-dimensional space, which creates chirality. And chirality just means, so in, in chemistry, chirality just means you've got a, a tetrahedral, I guess in OCHEM specifically, an sp3 atom with four different substituents. It could be more than that. You could have sp3d, um, but basically the true definition, the mathematical definition is a non-superimposable mirror image. When you take the mirror image of something, it's not the same thing. So the difference between your right hand and your left hand is a chair chiral. Depending on how good your work work is. Yeah, <laughs> assuming, assuming that it was um, symmetrical like that. Yeah, and if you took the mirror image of this, it's still the same chair, right? Unless you have one of those, those desks from high school where the, where the desk folds up and is attached to, to the right side of the table or the chair. That's chiral. Because if you took the mirror image of that, you wouldn't have your armrest on the right hand side, you'd have your armrest on the left hand side. So it's basically when you can tell when you have four different sides to an object in three dimensional space, you create a non superimposable mirror image. And so these glasses, if you take the mirror image of them, it's the same, right? But as soon as if you take the lens out of one side, taking the mirror image of them is not the same. On this pair of glasses, you're missing the right hand lens. This pair of glasses, you're missing the left hand lens. Is there anything where there's handedness? If there's a right, left, top, bottom, front, back, then that's going to be chiral. So like a car is chiral. So you take the mirror image of a car, you wind up with the driver's seat on the wrong side. Oh, all those British drivers. I know. They're they're just driving, driving. Right on the wrong side of the road. They're driving in Cairo. Well, all of the cars are Cairo. If you, if, <laughs> no. you, if you took a car that was just one seat, middle of the car, like a Formula, like a Formula One car, yeah. ignoring the fact that the engine is going to be Cairo, so ignoring the engine itself, but the shape of the car, that would be what we call a chiral, meaning if you take the mirror image, it looks the same as what you started with. Formula One has the chiral engine on Civic, not chiral. Really, it's symmetrical. It's symmetrical because it's, it's, it is. I mean, depending on where you draw the line. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, like two levels of chirality where, you know how like, in that example of the British driver, since the road is also chiral and then the driver like the car is also so the road is also chiral because it has direction and top and bottom. Um, if the road wasn't fixed to the ground, mm. yeah, like so the chiral. surface of the earth is chiral. The surface of the earth is chiral, which means the road is chiral because it's fixed to the surface of the earth. Which now has me thinking about race racetracks that are not fixed to the road. I'm thinking about Rainbow Road from Mario Kart. If you drive on the bottom, you could make it a chiral, or if you could make it symmetrical from front to back, you could make it so that you had a, an a chiral racetrack um, because it's not fixed to the ground. You could make it symmetrical so that the mirror image was the same, potentially. It would be tricky. And it would have to probably involve some Mobius strip style flipping upside down. But it's anyway. Um, so how do we the, the key aspect for us and specifically in OCHEM is that sp2 atoms will never be chiral because they're planar, right? Sp2 trigonal planar means if you take the mirror image of it, you can always get the same thing back because it's flat because it's planar. If you have a tetrahedral atom, an sp3 atom, 
with three different substituents, it's a chiral because you can't tell the difference between hydrogen one and hydrogen two. So if we looked at butane, Butane has three different things attached to it, to carbon two. It's got a methyl attached to carbon two and an ethyl and then two hydrogens. We can't tell the difference. If we take the mirror image of this, we're going to get ethyl, carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, methyl. So if it's non-superimposable, that means I can take the mirror image and all I have to do is flip it to get back to where I started. If I took this and flipped it, that puts the methyl back on the left-hand side, the ethyl on the right-hand side, and those two hydrogens at the top, we can't tell the difference between. So taking this molecule and flipping it, I get the same thing back as I started with. So that's a superimposable mirror image. We took the mirror image and we can take the mirror image and get back to where we started by treating it as a three-dimensional object. If I take one of these hydrogens and I replace it with a chlorine, now all of a sudden it's non-superimposable. Because now if I try to take this and flip it like a pancake to put that the methyl back where the methyl started, I flipped the chlorine and the hydrogen as well. And because if I took this and flipped it, now all of a sudden the carbon that was sticking out towards us is now sticking into the board and the hydrogen is out towards us. So in other words, taking this and rotating at 180, those two are not the same now. That's what we mean by a non-superimposable mirror image. When we take the mirror image and what we get, we can't take this physical object and just rotate it to get back to where we started. It doesn't matter how many ways you rotate your hand around, you can't make your right hand into your left hand. Right? All right, so that, that carbon, we refer to this carbon, a carbon that is sp3, or not just the carbon, any atom that's sp3, so it's tetrahedral, with four different substituents is a chiral carbon, or we also call that an asymmetric center. An asymmetric center in general just means that there's a stereoisomer, there. there's a possibility for a stereoisomer. So actually, technically, an alkene group is a stereocenter because there's a, that's a spot where you can create, or sorry, it's, a, it's not an asymmetric carbon, but it's an asymmetric center because if you flip one side of this, you get a different molecule. So any spot where you can create, um, where you can create stereoisomer is called asymmetric center or a stereo center. Stereo literally from the same root as, as stereo caught in your car, stereo means two. So stereo means there's two options. Hmm. How does that apply to car stereo? Because before you had 17 speakers in your car, you only had two speakers in your car. Oh. Or actually oh. all the two oldest channels. records. Yeah, two channels. That's how many words. Um, the oldest records were mono records, mm -hmm. meaning that there was no difference. If you, if you plug them into a modern stereo system, you'd get the same sound out of the left speaker is the right speaker. You only needed one speaker to play that record in its entirety. A stereo specifically means you had a right and a left. That was pretty good to know two weeks ago when I was fiddling with my stereo. <laughs> oh, and you've ever set up you know, speakers for your computer too, right? There's a right and left. And if you get them mixed up, if you tried to play some video game that had right and left in the sound, you would hear your sound coming from the left, but this, but the 
uh, character could be coming from the right if you mixed up your right and your left speakers, right? Or listening to the Beatles. Or yeah. listening to the Beatles. You hear the backwards. And it was about like, the mid 60s is when like, stereo records became more prominent. Everything before the mid 60s, they recorded it in mono, even if you had a stereo, because not everybody did. And car stereos only had one channel on the radio. They didn't have the ability to do stereo sound over the radio. So everybody recorded all their singles, especially in mono. But anything where if you put on headphones, you can hear two different things, that's stereo. Which I just found out recently, you can turn that off in Spotify. It's always bothered me to listen to music in headphones if I need to have one headphone off of one ear so I can hear what's going on. Yeah. It bothers me that you can't actually hear the same thing. You can act, there's the option in Spotify, you can have it, you can force it to be mono right. so that you only need one earbud in or one headphone. On. That would have been nice for high school when I was listening to the Beatles trying to get it. Right, and you're getting half of the words and you're in the, the, the <laughs> Yeah. I think that's relatively new, to be honest, because I have, I've gone through all the settings in Spotify for years and I just noticed that in like the last six months or something. That's like pretty that. convenient. <laughs> it is. Especially if you don't have your wiring all together in your car. Right. Yeah, if, you, if you're doing your own wiring. <laughs> um, one of the ways that this winds up making a really big difference. So in physical objects, right hand versus left hand means your right handed glove won't fit on your left hand, right? Um, the, and that's a similar issue that we see with enzymes. Oh, sorry, we're over time, huh? You might as well end there for today. We'll talk about this in more details, in more detail on um, Thursday. All right, so we'll start, we'll start loud a couple minutes late since I went over here. I didn't, I lost track of the time. Sorry. Um, no, it's okay. <laughs> like I said, I wasn't sure if we were going to touch on this at all. So you'll get to see this for a second time and get practice with these as well as system trans naming on Thursday. Um, and then I will make sure that I hit publish on that. It, check the week six page. Um, the link is there, but if I hadn't, haven't yet published, then I'll go do that when I go sit down at my desk in a second. Yeah, sure.